ever get that feeling like these days digitally everything's getting a bit too perfect yeah. like we're losing something you know and all that polish yeah yeah well that's kind of what we're diving into today okay with these artists uh rebecca Barron and douglas goodwin interesting they're using well technology to explore um those fascinating imperfections mm. and trust me it's way more interesting than it sounds okay we've got like their film festival programs, articles about their lossless exhibit, even Goodwin's notes on AI and deepfakes. Wow. It's a lot to unpack. Yeah. But that's why you have us. Absolutely. And the heart of it mm. um, is understanding how Barron and Goodwin use art to explore this space between, well, you know, how tech keeps advancing. Right. Our obsession with a flawless image and how those two things kind of make us feel. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's start with the basics. Okay. Who are Barron and Goodwin? They're described as digital archaeologists, which I got to say sounds way cooler than my desk job. <laughs> right. It's a fitting title because essentially they're excavating the hidden layers beneath, well, the images we create and consume, mm -hmm. uncovering how they shape our reality. Okay. Baron, for instance, she talks about the unsayable. Uh huh. These things, uh, images evoke in us you know, emotionally. Right. That they can't express outright. It's like that that gut punch you get from a photo. Yeah, yeah. That takes you back to, like, a specific moment or a film scene that captures an emotion perfectly, but it goes beyond words. Precisely. Yeah. And Goodwin, his fascination with uh, both cutting-edge tech and vintage analog devices adds another dimension. Okay. He blends these worlds seamlessly, reminding us that the digital... It's built on the foundation of the analog. Which brings us to their art installation, Lossless. Okay. It's like a love letter to all the imperfections that digital progress tries to erase. Interesting. You know, like, remember that comforting static of a, a worn out VHS tape? Mm -hmm. They're saying those, those like, flaws, they actually reveal something deeper about our relationship with images and memory. They're taking iconic films like um, The Wizard of Oz, The Searchers, mm -hmm. instead of restoring them to you know, pristine digital clarity. They're highlighting the glitches, the artifacts, mm. that ghost in the machine, if you will. Mm. It makes you question, like, what are we losing in our pursuit of the perfect image? Is digital truly lossless? It's such a great question because, like, we think digital is flawless, right? Right. But Baron and Goodwin, they're bringing back that grain, that mm -hmm. wear and tear. And it makes you feel something. It's the difference between a Photoshop Instagram post right. and a faded Polaroid. Yeah. The Polaroid might not be technically perfect, but it just feels more human, more real. Yeah, and that concept of real, it's constantly being challenged, especially with, well, the rise of AI. Yeah. Goodwin even tells his students to like expect pain when working with it. Oh wow. Because it's not about, you know, pushing a button and getting a masterpiece. Right. AI can be unpredictable defiant even which honestly is kind of reassuring to hear yeah. it means that human element of struggle of like wrangling with this powerful force it isn't gone right we're not just handing over the reins to the machines completely exactly and that struggle it exposes our assumptions about technology okay we expect it to be subservient predictable ai challenges that mm -hmm. reminds us that it doesn't always play by our rules it's like we think we've mastered something, but then we try to teach it to a machine. Right. And we realize we've barely scratched the surface. Uh -huh. This tension between, like, control and chaos, this is something Baron and Goodwin, they really lean into, huh? Absolutely. It plays out particularly well in uh, their exploration of, you know, deep fakes. Okay. We see this technology used for both, you know, silly things. Yeah. Like, like face swapping with celebrities online. Sure. And, and then deeply unsettling purposes. Right. And Goodwin doesn't shy away from those uncomfortable examples. No, no. He highlights that film using deep fakes to critique, um, what was it, influencer culture? Yes, yes. For instance. And another artist who merged the face of, um, oh, what was his name? Sri Lankan president. Oh, right. Rabia Rajapaksa. Yes, him. Onto a child's body I as like a powerful statement about his regime. It throws the ethics of this technology into sharp relief. Yeah. Making us question like when does it become exploitative and when can it be a tool for you know social commentary or even truth telling it's like they're holding up a distorted mirror to society yeah peeling you know. back the layers to expose what's underneath right and sometimes it's not pretty 
but it does force us to confront these uncomfortable truths about ourselves and how technology can manipulate us. And that manipulation, it isn't always some external force. It could be, well, internal too. Okay. This leads us to another fascinating aspect of Goodwin's work. Okay. The ghost in the machine. As a reflection of our own, well, our own desires, our anxieties, mm -hmm. take his self-portrait as Ryan Gosling. Now, that's just asking for an identity crisis. Seriously. Yeah. Using your own face to, like, puppet a machine into making you look like someone else, does that output still represent you in some way? It raises such compelling questions, you know, about authenticity and authorship in the age of AI. Right. Like, where does the self begin and end when technology can so convincingly uh, mimic and alter our image? And it's not just about, like, artistic expression, right? This this blurring between the human and the artificial. Right. It's, it's seeping into, like, our everyday lives. Absolutely. Good when he brings up the example of um, Google Pixel phones. Oh, okay. They analyze the raw image you, know, yeah. you capture, and then they show you a flattering version. Right. It's subtle. Mm. But we're essentially training AI to prefer and perpetuate an idealized version of ourselves. So it's like the camera adding 10 pounds is one thing, right? but now it's the AI doing it. Exactly. Smoothing wrinkles, brightening eyes, and we're going along with it, liking, sharing, filtering ourselves into these like digitally enhanced versions of perfection. It's both fascinating and a little creepy. It's that, that feedback loop of self-optimization. Yeah. You mentioned it earlier. Yeah. But like, whose ideal are we striving for? Right. And what happens when AI starts, you know, creating art or even curating our world based on these often unattainable standards? Okay, that is a bit bleak. Is there like, is there a way to be more aware of this influence? Mm -hmm. Or are we all destined to become, you know, slaves to the algorithm? I wouldn't say we're slaves just yet. Okay. Remember, Baron and Goodwin, they're not anti-technology. Right. They're urging us to be more, well, critical okay we're conscious of how we use it okay and how it uses us so it's about being like active participants in this digital world yeah. not just passive consumers letting algorithms dictate our our tastes and perceptions but how do we actually do that right. i mean i'm not about to like go create an experimental film or anything right right well it, it starts with simple awareness okay paying attention to how technology is already shaping our our choices and values okay like noticing how um social media algorithms, you know, mm -hmm. they feed us content. How those filters, they they subtly change how we see ourselves and, and others. Okay, so instead of just like scrolling mindlessly, we need to be asking, why am I seeing this? Yeah. Is this a true reflection of reality yes. or like an algorithmically curated version? That's exactly. That's and then question it. Push back against that urge to always optimize, to conform to those those digital yeah. ideals. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the raw, the unfiltered, the authentically human. Embrace the glitches, you could say. Exactly. But this idea of like AI generated art being all about, you know, perfection. Right. Goodwin also talks about uh the slot machine aesthetic. Right. Where does that fit in? That's that's a crucial point. He's talking about artists who use AI more like a well, a digital slot machine. Okay. You know, feeding in prompts and yeah. hoping for a visually appealing result. It's like outsourcing creativity to an algorithm. Right. And it often lacks, well, that depth, that human touch. So it's the difference between an artist using AI as a tool to, like, push boundaries yeah. and explore new forms of expression. Yes. Versus someone just chasing that, that algorithmic jackpot. Exactly. But if we're talking about, like, pushing boundaries, we have to go back to that um, code swishing idea you mentioned earlier. Oh, right, yeah. How does that work with AI art? Imagine an artist tricking the AI, mm -hmm. you know, bending its algorithms in ways it wasn't uh, explicitly programmed to do. It's about understanding the technology well enough to, to subvert its intended purpose, to coax something unexpected and truly unique from it. So it's less about feeding it prompts right. and more about like having a conversation with it. Exactly. A kind of creative push and pull. Exactly. And that kind of ingenuity, that willingness to experiment and even wrestle with the technology, yeah. that's what leads to truly uh, groundbreaking art. It's mm -hmm. what separates you know the artist from the algorithm. And that concept of like creative rebellion, yeah. it feels even more important in a world where everything is becoming increasingly like 
standardized, homogenized. Right, right. Like okay. anyone can slap on a filter to make themselves look like a Kardashian, okay. right? But it takes real skill to use those tools to like say something new, something that's uniquely you. Precisely. It's about using technology to amplify your own voice, mm. not erase it. Mm. And that brings us back to the core of Baron and Goodwin's work, mm -hmm. the intersection of, you know, art, technology, and what it means to be human in this increasingly digital world. Yeah. We've we've covered a lot of ground here. We have. From digital archaeology to deep fakes, from AI interns mm -hmm. to that slot machine aesthetic. It's a lot. Of... It's a lot to wrap your head around. So as we as we head into the final stretch here, what's like the one thing you want our listener to walk away with? You know, Goodwin said it best in his essay. We see things not as they are, but as we are. It's a powerful reminder that our relationship with technology, it's a reflection of, well, ourselves. Whoa. Our desires our anxieties, our values. So how we choose to engage with technology, how we shape it yes, and yeah. allow it to shape us, right. reveal something like fundamental about who we are as, as human beings. Exactly. It's a bit like, you know, holding up a mirror to our, our collective soul mm. and what we see reflected back at us. For better or worse, it's well, it's us. That is that is profound. So where do we where do we go from here? Are we just supposed to like sit with this existential dread or do do Baron Goodwin offer any any glimpses of hope, any ways to like navigate this this increasingly complex relationship with technology? I wouldn't say they offer like a prescriptive solution. OK, but their work, it does suggest a way forward. It's about embracing those very things that, mm -hmm. that make us human, mm -hmm. the the messy, the imperfect, the unpredictable. It's about recognizing that technology for all its power, it's ultimately a, well, it's a tool. Right. And like any tool, it can be used to create or destroy, mm -hmm. to connect or isolate. The choice ultimately is is ours. So how do we ensure we're, we're using these tools consciously, well, thoughtfully, even, even rebelliously, like those artists code switching the algorithms? Yeah. How do we make sure that we're the ones holding the paintbrush, so to speak, <laughs> and not, not the other way around? It's a constant, it's a constant dance. A negotiation. Okay. We need to be willing to ask those tough questions <sighs> about how technology is impacting our, our lives, yeah. our relationships, our, our very sense of self even. And we need to be prepared to to challenge the status quo. Right. To push back against the, the seductive allure of convenience and optimization. It's about reclaiming that sense of agency, of authorship. Yeah. Even in a world where algorithms seem to be like, calling the shots it's about remembering that we have the power yes to choose how we interact with technology right. how we allow it to shape our perceptions and experiences yeah. we don't we don't have to accept the the flattering filter the algorithmically curated feed the slot machine aesthetic as as like the inevitable future precisely and that's where art plays such a crucial role okay. it can help us you know see the world differently, challenge our assumptions, imagine alternative possibilities. It reminds us that there's there's more to life than what can be quantified and optimized and digitized. It's about finding like beauty in the glitches, yeah. humanity in the imperfections. Right. It's about recognizing that those those quirks, those yeah. deviations from the norm, yeah. they're often what make us interesting, what make us what make us human. Right. And as as AI and other technologies continue to evolve, it's those qualities we need to hold on to, yeah. to nurture, to celebrate. It's a it's a conversation we need to keep having. Yeah. A journey we need to take, well, together. Yeah. Because the future of technology, it isn't something that's simply happening to us. It's something we're actively creating. Right. Through our choices, yeah. our values, our actions. Well said. And on that note, we're about to wrap up our uh, deep dive into the work of Rebecca Barron and Douglas Goodwin. But before we go, we wanted to leave you with a little something to to think about. If you could create an AI companion that looked and sounded like anyone living or dead, who would it be? Mm. And more importantly, why? What does that choice reveal about the kind of connection you seek in a world increasingly mediated by technology? It's a question worth pondering. Until next time. Keep asking those tough questions, embrace the glitches, and remember, the future is not pre-programmed. We're writing the code as we go.